Welcome back to another episode of New Orleans Stop Football presented by PJ's Coffee. If you need a coffee, make sure you stop by one of their many locations. And if you need a new car, make sure you check out my guy, Matt Bowers, dealerships all over the, the region, all kinds of different types of cars, best prices, best customer care, best service, the best car buying experience that you can find. All right. We got a lot of great stuff for you guys in today's show. We're going to talk about some of the free agents we think the Saints should target, whether they should upgrade positions through the draft or free agency or keep their own guys. We're going to talk about their free agents we think are going to get the biggest deals on the open market and a whole lot more. We're going to touch on some of the stuff that we're hearing at the Combine. So make sure you stay tuned right after this short break and we're going to get into all of that on today's episode. The New Orleans Dot Football Show is proudly presented by PJ's Coffee. PJ's Coffee has some of the best drinks that you can find. They have locations all over the city. They have pastries and everything else you need to get your day started. So go check them out. Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring? Look no further than Friend & Company Fine Jewelers New Engagement Salon. This new area houses a wide selection of engagement rings to choose from in all cuts, sizes, and colors. Their experienced staff offer five-star customer care, to help you find the perfect ring to express your love. Visit their new engagement salon today. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers, the perfect ring for the perfect moment and also for the perfect person. 7713 Maple Street between Adams and Burdett Street. 504-866-5433. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers. Check them out at friendandcompany.com. Hard Hide Punch Tool Strawberry Whiskey is an 86 proof blend of aged wheat bourbon, American light whiskey, and fresh Punch Tool strawberries. Blended in New Orleans, it is not for the thin skinned. Look for it in your favorite stores, bars, and restaurants. New Orleans Stop Football is proud to be sponsored by Firehouse Subs. Make sure you check out their location on Veterans Boulevard. All right, let's get into the show. All right, let's get into our lead topic presented by Friend and Company Fine Jewelers, the official jewelers of the New Orleans Saints. Friend and Company has an outstanding engagement salon that just opened up recently. All kinds of different types of rings, prices from low to high. All of them are beautiful. Their customer care is unbelievable. Get your engagement rings there. Get started down the journey. Your wedding rings, your anniversary gifts, all of it. They'll take care of you for your entire life, and it's a good time to get started with them. And while you're there, make sure you check out their Florida Lee earring and necklace that you see on your screen right here. They are specially priced for our NOF audience. And uh, make sure you tell them we sent you when you go in there. All right. So how do you think the Saints should fill their needs? Should they re-sign their guys, upgrade, or draft them? Here at the Combine, it's kind of a strange week in the NFL. The draft takes center stage, but, like, this is the the birthplace of free agency. And Ten days away. Yeah. yeah, you kind of start hearing some of the rumors. People get a feel for their market. They know who wants them, who doesn't want them. They aren't negotiating, but they probably are negotiating a little bit behind closed doors um but yeah when it comes to the saints needs like they have to decide should they wait for the draft or should they sign people and we kind of actually heard that a little bit that they feel comfortable going into the draft with some of their needs and adjusting them that way um so that's kind of interesting to see how that might go but we don't think they're going to make major splashes in free agency probably just more modest signings than nathan shepherd type guys that are out there so who do you think they should just resign? Who should they try to upgrade in free agency? Who should they try to draft? Who would you target? Let's go through this position by position. All right. And let's start at uh, defensive end. Oh, well, I've been saying this over and over again. I think the readers can probably hear by now. I think you've got to address it in free agency. You can address it in free agency and the draft. That would be fine by me. But you cannot wait to the draft. You cannot go to the draft without having addressed defensive end yet. Um, I mean, I would love it if they were going top of the market. We don't think they're going to go top of the market. But – that doesn't mean they can't go modest, like we said uh, on our last show. I mean, even in this current cap era, Derek Carr aside, I mean, they signed Tyron Matthew for $9 million one year. I think they could be in that range. I don't know if someone like Zadarius Smith. Oh, that's the guy on my list. Okay, we'll talk about him in a sec. I don't know how much he's going to cost. I've mentioned before I like Jonathan Greenard. He might cost a little too much. A.J. Epinesa is a guy in that very next tier uh, from the Bills who hasn't quite hit yet. He reminds me of like a Zach Bond type uh, for another team, Caden Ellis type for another team that, that maybe hits with the next team. Um, but I want them to spend their most money there, and I want them to address it in free agency so that, look, if they want to draft Dallas Turner in round one of the draft, that's great. I don't think they can go into the draft needing to draft Dallas Turner. Yeah, like, like Greenard was kind of one of the guys I was looking at, and it just it felt too rich. And, like, if you were ranking – like, I was looking at NFL.com, and I think he was, like, 15th on their list, and I was like, this is probably yeah. not where they're going to be shopping at. I hope they are, but 
I don't think they will be. So Darius Smith felt like believable as yeah. kind of like one of them middle tier guys cost a little bit. He's not going to be cheap, cheap, but he's going to be cheaper than the top tier guys. We do have 10 sacks two years ago, five sacks last year. Um, so, I mean, he, he's still a productive player. He, it seems like his injury issues are, are behind him a little bit, but he felt like somebody in that range that feels believable yep. and that you're still okay, like going into the draft and potentially trying to replace him right away and moving him down to like a rotational type guy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably the most believable range of player. And I think if you're if you're pushing up a little bit, that might be the one spot where they they push up right. a little bit. There's but. some young guys who are about to get paid for the first time. I, I, that's, that's what Greenard is. Um, what, uh, some of the guys, if they really mean it, to, to go the more outside linebacker range. What, Uche, um, who's the guy from the Jets that you had been mentioned a couple times? Like, uh, Huff. Um, yeah, so uh, – I wouldn't mind a big investment there in a young player who's going to be part of the nucleus of the team, but I just I'm kind of betting against it, especially since the entire league has more money to play with. Yeah, now. I don't think I don't think Uche. I don't know. I would be a little surprised. I know that he was shopped around at the deadline last year, and it didn't seem like there was like a, a major um, level of interest from the Saints. But I guess when you take the draft compensation out of it, maybe anything's on the table. I think they probably would want somebody that's a little bit more three down ish right. potentially um we did hear um someone say look they are absolutely open to the idea of outside linebackers being a bigger part of the pass rush and needing guys put them anywhere on the field add to the pass rush add to the pass rush but it doesn't mean that they don't still believe in needing bigger guys playing defense events they they're not going to all of a sudden have six foot two 235 pound defense events but they will add the occasional six foot two 240 pound player and figure out a way to make them a situational pass rusher, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think they'd probably be open to the 6'4", 240 players, though, like <laughs> Dallas Turner. I mean, I think yeah. that's somebody that they'd probably definitely be um, I, I actually to. talked to Turner the other day specifically about that because I'm always thinking size and weight. And he talked about his weight journey. At one point he said he was as low as, I think he said 6'25". By the end of his rookie season, he started at 6'40". But he said his junior year last year, he was 255. He said it was his favorite weight. He said he could feel the difference in strength, but felt like he played just as fast and maybe even faster Six four two fifty five is perfectly fine with the saints for what they need yeah i mean as long as you're getting it done at this point um yeah um so what do you do are, are you are you free agency draft free agency is a must yeah it's just how much do i spend but i add it and then and then i still want to draft it too but i don't i don't want the draft I, I, I don't want to be like forcing myself into a bad pick in the draft because i haven't filled it yet the only way i'm okay with not free agent like if they go through free agency and they don't sign a guy i would be potentially okay with that if if they have something in place to go up and make sure they're getting Dallas Turner like yeah. if you are and I hate the idea of trading up in the shaft with their draft compensation but if you have something in place and you go up and get him like on March 15th like the outrage of not getting a guy in the first I guess four days of free agency is the tampering period but it's technically two that's the only way but like I'd be okay with it but yeah it yeah, could I, just force you into a, a overpaying yeah yeah, but yeah, that would that would definitely that would definitely be a a tough way to kind of go about it because that's that's dangerous, man. Like if you go in there and you're like, we're gonna get the guy at 14, and you get shut out, that's it's unforgivable. You're like, well, we don't love this edge rusher, but we we corner ourselves, so we have to. Yeah. Well, look, we think Peyton Turner is gonna be healthy. Like you can't you can't, you can't do it that way. You We've got a good Martin's question way. on on the guys that are currently in their depth chart there, though, coming up later. So we will talk about more about that. And we'll talk a lot about it this offseason, that position. Uh, offensive tackle, what are you doing? That's a draft position for me. Um, I also say and re-sign Andrus Pete. Um, but w even if they don't re-sign Andrus Pete, um, I, think it's, I think it's a must with one of those first two draft picks. I really do. Um, Pete would be temporary. James Hurst is temporary heading into the final year of his deal, assuming they're going to keep him. Um, and Trevor Penning is just such an unknown. Ryan Ramchek is an unknown because of injury. I need a young guy in the pipeline who is going to be a core starter for me. And just because I've missed on that position a couple times in recent years doesn't stop me from doing it again. I, and I love this year's draft class for – if with that 14th pick in particular, I love – all the options. There's a chance they're going to fall in love with three different guys. There's eight or nine guys being talked about as worthy of, of a pick between 10 and 20. The chances of them loving a couple I think are high. I mean, even if you wait till 45, I think the fact that there's so many to choose from, maybe you get a good one at 45 too. Maybe you trade up or down. Maybe you get an additional pick somewhere. But, man, one, I, I want an offensive lineman and particularly an offensive tackle with one of those top 50 picks. Yeah, I think my, my, my ideal approach here is I, I bring back Pete. I have the stopgap there. I can use him at either spot, inside, outside. 
and then I draft whoever I can somehow within that, and I bring him into the, the mix. But, look, it, it's kind of a weird position because it, it feels like an absolute must, but if you bring back Pete and Saldaveri plays, like, you you probably got your starters across the board if you get shut out in the draft. Like, there's a path here where it's okay. Like, if the scheme's better, you're building the run game better, you're using play action right, you're using motion right, your offensive line should get a little bit better. But I agree, it feels like a must to me, but there is kind of like a – an element of if you kind of go through some of these and it's like, well, if they got shut out here and it's worst case scenario, that's one spot where I feel like they can't survive if they keep Pete. That it, Pete, yeah, but I, this is a position where I don't know if it makes a ton of sense to sign the Zadarius Smith type of guy. Like, I don't know about the 31 year old, $12 million veteran one year deal at offensive tackle. I feel like it's a position where they need to get younger and Pete can be a stopgap for that. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, that's the ideal outcome for sure. No, no question about it. Uh, receiver, um, I'll go first on this one. I, I think it's a spot where they they got to address it. Um, I'm okay with free agency or draft. I kind of like the idea of getting an older player there because everybody else is so young. So if you got somebody in the room that's kind of been around a little bit, I, I kind of like the idea of of doing that. Tyler Boyd, I think you've mentioned him before, and I I don't know, he's kind of stuck in my head now as a guy that, that I kind of like. Glad I have that influence in that over spot. you. Yeah, the <laughs> – Big, big, strong guy can play in the slot. I'm sure you could put him in the outside, too, if you needed to. Um, and it just he's, he's been around good players. I don't know. It's, he just kind of feels like somebody that would be a good fit in that room. And if I'm kind of prioritizing draft needs and they stay put with pick 45 as their pick and then they don't go get until the fifth round, I don't know that I love the idea of using one of those top two picks on a wide receiver if you have some of these other needs. So kind of stacking the board that way, just in the ideal – of how you put this together, I think I would go free agency first. Or I completely agree. And, and it's the opposite of offensive tackle for me. It's the one position where they don't need to get younger necessarily. They have a lot of young talent. I like Alave, I like Shahid, and I like A.T. Perry, and I think all of them are, are plans for, for this year and the future. So I want to get this guy, and, and yeah, Tyler Boyd would be great. Maybe Tyler Boyd costs $10 million or more a year, so maybe that's too high. We've talked about Jawan Jennings, who, who Clint Kubiak just worked with. He's a restricted free agent. I like that idea. But there's a, there's a lot of veteran guys. A, another one that um, that uh, Clint Kubiak worked with uh, in Minnesota is KJ Osborne. But look, there there are veteran guys who can fill that. We've talked a lot about Hunter Renfro being a trade possibility with the Raiders. Um, I I think that's an area where I just want to I want to find good value in free agency or trade. Um, and maybe you wait a little bit and, and wait for the guy who didn't get the big contract he was expecting at that position. But but yeah, that is not uh, you know of course. There's a lot of good receivers in the draft. If you draft one in round one, you're you're adding to a strength. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I kind of like the idea of a modest free agent signing to just round that group out even more than needing to get younger there necessarily. What are you doing at tight end? That I'm probably more draft. I mean, look, I've we've talked a lot about wide receiver and tight end being sort of interchangeable. If they wanted to fill this pass catching void, like we said with uh, Jonu Smith, who just got released by Atlanta, Dalton Schultz, somebody like that, and they're like. We've done it that way instead. There's a little bit of an interchangeable uh, um, element to it. But, you know, ideally, if I'm picking them all right now, I'm, I'm probably going veteran receiver and then maybe one of those fourth or fifth round picks, comp picks or whatever on, on a young tight end. Yeah, I, I like the idea of Jonu. I, he's someone that I kind of just keep thinking about more and more. He had a really good season last year. Um, you know, he has familiarity with the system. So that's something that I think that would probably be a good thing for him. Um, you know, I think he just kind of got squeezed out of it at Atlanta because they're going to go to the McVay stuff and they just don't use two tight ends. So, I mean, one of them was expendable. I think it was him. I like, I like the idea of kind of getting the sure thing at, the, at that position. And I feel like you can make big impact at tight end and, and the position value is a little bit lower. And I don't know if you hit there. I think that that could be a spot that kind of helps your, your offense quite a bit. They would have a ton of tight ends, though. Um, yeah. And they'd have well, to Jimmy Graham's on the way it. out for sure. Jimmy Graham's sure, on the yeah, way out. Yeah. Taysom gets reclassified, so you're kind of right back at the right number, I guess. But I like the idea. I like the idea of, of adding somebody at that position. I feel like you can get kind of more closer to the top of the free agent market for a lower cost, and it kind of just feels like a place where they can make a difference there. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm fine either way. Like, if they want to tie down, I'm fine, free agency or draft. Um, and, you know, if Bowers is there at 14 and everything else misses, I, I'm fine with, with – even making the pick there in the first round. I think you get a lot of mileage out of that. All right, uh, moving on to the defense. You're you're in my head now. Uh, defensive tackle, you mentioned the the nose tackle that doesn't cost that much just to help your, your run game. And, look, I mean, they could re-sign Malcolm Roach depending on his health outlook, or they could try to upgrade and it wouldn't cost a lot to get a guy that, hey, you're just playing 24 snaps a game for me. 
Uh, you're the big run stuffing defensive tackle. I, I tried to ask around. I tried to find the right name. You know, one of the free agents this year is Sheldon Rankins. I think he might cost a little too much because he's got some pass rush ability. The cheaper guys are the guys who they don't even pretend that they're going to help with your pass rush. They're like, no, you were just playing rundowns. I don't know if Shelby Harris quals, qualifies for that. Chances are it's probably a Malcolm Roach type player from another team that, that that's a name we're not too familiar with. But but you're right. I I think I think that's where you can add is is. Because they've got depth at defensive tackle. They've got Brian Brzee. Colin Saunders isn't going anywhere. Nathan Shepard isn't going anywhere. Um, so they're just looking for a guy who can give you those run snap downs. And, and, and maybe I add that in free agency and don't have to pay a lot for it. I, you could, I think you could even go Roach and somebody. Like, yeah. bring them both and have them compete. Like, if one of them doesn't make the team, so be it. It's not a big deal. Um, look, I think the best thing to do for their run defense, though, honestly, is just control the ball more like honestly i think it's the best thing control the ball more get some early leads take some pressure off it i think that that would make a massive massive difference with them um i don't know that there is like the like the life altering type player that you're going to bring in for your run defense but yeah i mean i think there's, i mean there there's are some ways. defensive tackles that are probably going to make like 20 million dollars this year that would be great yeah it's like i think <laughs> they're not some, in that market. i think there's some cheap ways to kind of you know tighten it up a little bit but it's the best thing they can do is get better on a on a um on offense. All right. Oh, we skipped guard. No, that's a, that's next after defensive tackle. I uh, Oh, we got guard. Okay. I have guard as draft, too. Um, there's a little interchangeability with offensive tackle and guard. Um, a little either or, especially when you consider that Pete and Hurst and possibly Penning could all be tackles or guards, even though it doesn't sound like they have any plans to, to try Trevor Penning out at guard yet. But I like guard in the draft. I, um especially if you don't get a tackle, then go ahead and give me a guard just to help with that depth at 45 or else bring in another young guard in the middle rounds or whatever. They do have Nick Saldivari in the pipeline, but it's just a position where they have to get younger across the board. So so I, I like the idea of adding one or two young developmental players in my offensive line. Yeah, my approach to guard is the same thing. Pete back, if you got to move him inside, move him inside. If you can get somebody in the draft, get somebody in the draft. Um, I'm cool with just – Kind of roll us out of area at that, it's that sure, spot. Sure. Almost it's not. Of, we're not in the musts anymore. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, I think. I think. I don't know. I, I kind of. I need a tackle or a guard at least. I, in the draft. I hope I don't end up like regretting having the belief in Sal Deveri. Like I keep building him up in my mind. Like he might be my biggest offseason riser. It's just like the system fits him. His athletic traits fit him. Fit him all that stuff. So, um, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's something that I think I would be okay either way. Outside linebacker. I mean, we're talking about like a Bond type player. I bring. I just bring back Bond. I don't know. I kind of like Bond in that role. Yeah, I, you you can't ignore this. I mean, you've got Demario Davis, you've got Pete Werner, and then you've got nothing. I mean, the other guy who 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 played the most backup snaps last year was Nephi Sewell. Oh, you're talking and, you're talking more like a will, um, but anything, anything. I mean, edge rushing outside linebacker, third linebacker, whatever, like whatever it is. This this is kind of a must position for them. They need to figure out where they're getting their depth because if they let Bond go in free agency and Nephi Sewell is not going to be healthy for training camp, they just don't have bodies there. But I would like it to be a Bond type who who can give me a few of those Sam snaps. Who I mean, well, how about Caden Ellis? I mean, he could be the third guy on the field, give you some pass rush snaps, and then when Pete Werner and Demario Davis miss time, Caden Ellis could also fill in there. I mean, that would be the dream scenario. So, I I, I think Bond's sort of my like baseline. If they want to upgrade and spend on someone who's even better, if they want to draft a guy who can fill that void, but they. They do need a body there, so I think I re-sign Zach Bond just to make sure I have somebody. But I've got my eye out for possibly an upgrade if there. We're, if we're talking about like a Nephi replacement, is completely oh, got to yeah. be a completely different type of player. I right, mean, right, yeah, right, I right. mean, but yeah, I mean, if we're talking like the guy that just kind of rushes off the edge every now and then, like I just bring back Bond. But if you get like Dallas Turner or something, I feel like the Bond type of player isn't even a, a need at true, that point. True, like, You kind of just eliminate that from your offense and you or your defense, and, and you just you know, you blitz a little bit more with Demario to kind of get some of that other look or from the slot. But like, I, I move completely away from that. If I if I take handle business at defensive end, like I'm not even looking for the the little little yeah. linebacker guy to be out there. So it's just kind of a matter of how you kind of put the the groceries together. But yeah, I do agree. We heard that Nephi's knee was kind of bad, and it might be a thing that goes into training camp potentially. So I think you got to do something to get the will type linebacker for sure. Yeah. All right, um, cornerback. Yeah, I re-sign Isaac Gautam. I think it's Same important. Thing. Same yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, Marshawn Lattimore is going to dictate this a lot. If you're trading away Marshawn Lattimore, you're getting an extra draft pick if you do that. Maybe you still just re-sign Isaac Gautam and Ugo Amadi in the slot and, and then try to draft one. 
I don't know that you trade Marshawn and then you immediately go and pay a lot of money for somebody like that. But but with or without Marshawn, I think I want to re-sign Isaac Adam. Yeah, I, I sign Ike, and then if Marshawn goes, um, I move Alante to the outside and I draft a slot, like or, or sign a slot, like whatever it is. Like that's again, it's a cheaper way to go about it. And Alante's best spot is on the outside. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I think agree you just with have that. to go there. Um, I agree with that. Going to safety, I think this one's kind of interesting. Um, if everybody comes back, I don't think it's a major – it's a, it's a luxury to add to it at that point. You're looking at the future a little bit. Marcus May is a goner. Like, I think you have – I don't know. It kind of depends on, on how you view Howden. Um, but I do think that at that point you have to spend something somewhere to try to get somebody into to that spot. Are you re-signing both Lonnie Johnson Jonathan Abram? Neither one or the other – yeah, I probably keep them. I mean, they're going to cost something. They were great. Yeah, they were good. Cheap. I felt yeah. like they were good players to have around. They they ended up needing them at, at different points. Um, Lonnie had the injury at the end of the season. It felt like Abram was like a really good locker room guy as well as like a good like energy type player. But yeah, I, I if I can't imagine them having a strong market like yeah. whether you're competing. Um, I could see somebody paying a little bit more and it prices you out. But if they're cheap, I'm bringing them both back. Yeah, I agree. And. I mean, then maybe I look in the draft, but if I keep May and I keep Lonnie and I keep Abram, I certainly don't don't need a free agent uh, to fill that. Backup QB, um, give me Sam Darnold. Just right. I, I like, like I like I like the the Forty Niners tie in. Yeah, bring somebody in that can kind of help teach the system a little bit on the field as well. Uh, you know, I I just like the idea. I do too, but if like I said, I think we talked about this before. I think Sam Darnold should want to stay in San Francisco. Yeah. If San Francisco likes him, there's nowhere I'd rather be the backup quarterback than than behind uh, Brock Purdy in San Francisco. So, is Jameis a consideration for you? Yeah, I mean, I got nothing against Jameis. I mean, if if it makes sense, the price is right, locker room loves him. I, I got nothing against that. Tell me when you hear the right name, because some of these guys are probably cost too much. Tannehill. If you're if you're parting ways with uh, Winston, Garoppolo, Minshew, Flacco, Brissett, right, well, Tyrod like, Taylor, like it, dep- it depends where Jimmy's at. Like if Jimmy, I can't see him being cheap enough. But but if he is, again, another guy that has just intimate knowledge of the system. Um, I like the, I, I like the idea. There's so many of these guys that some of these guys are going to have to take veteran minimum deals. Look, Jimmy Jimmy was a Raider, like so that brings. <laughs> <laughs> they do like the Raiders. They do like the Raiders. Listen, I'm going to keep going. Kirk Cousins. Uh, Russell Wilson, Baker Mayfield, obviously, are going to get paid. Brissett, Tyrod Taylor, Marcus Mariota, Carson Wentz, Mason Rudolph, Drew Locke, Tyler Huntley, Josh I mean, there's Dobbs. Just, there's so many. There's so many that are that are going to be good back. Ten of these guys are going to have to take the veteran minimum deal. Yeah. That, that's why I think – I mean, I honestly think Jam- Jameis might be back because I don't think Jameis gets paid unless he just clearly wants a change of scenery. Yeah. Yeah, def- definitely interesting. All right. Um, moving on to our money segment, which kind of still plays into this one, still talking about the markets a little bit. Uh, our money segment is presented by Jefferson Financial Federal Credit Union. We just mentioned some of these guys, but if there is a market for any of the Saints free agents among other teams, who do we think will command the biggest deals in New Orleans or elsewhere? I think the guy that's going to get paid the most, um, and we'll just start with him. I, I think I think Andrews Pete kind of has. He's pretty fascinating to me. He potentially has the best market. Like somebody could look at him and say, like he's a starter, and I think if that's the case, like he is someone that could get paid a little bit. So he got paid $11 million a year the last time as a free agent by the Saints, which everyone thought was an overpay, uh, but he was definitely just a guard at that point. Last year he played so well at left tackle, that increases his value. The fact that he could be a left tackle or a guard, that increases his value. But I, that, he took a pay cut last year to $5.5 million. Do you think it costs more than $5.5 million to yeah, keep I th- him Yeah, I, I think he helped his market. I do. I think I think he kind of you got he look playing tackle too. I think kind of elevates your value a little bit. It's I think it's somewhere in between. What what were the numbers? Eleven million used 5. to be eleven, 5. and then last year it was five point five. Yeah, I think it's somewhere in between the two. I think he's like a low end starter for some. Say eight million dollars. Do you resign him at eight million? You know the one thing that I think helps quite a bit though with the market is that the draft is going to be so strong at tackle. Like that might suppress the dollars spent in free agency a little bit. So eight million though. Yeah, I'm doing it. You. I love that he could fill my tackle or guard spot. Eight's a little, eight's a little high, but we wouldn't have, they wouldn't have to worry about this if Trevor Penning. I mean, I think you have to pay him because you don't know what Penning is. I think I do eight. I think eight feels like a good number, a fair number. Uh, what do you think uh, the market's going to look like for Mike Thomas? God, he's such an unknown because of the injuries. Um, I don't think teams will be too turned off by like you know him saying things about the quarterback on social media. He's a great player. They're going to see the film of how valuable he was early in the season. But I also think he's going to choose a team. You know, I think he's going to want to go to the Chiefs or the Lions or the you know, 
more so than you know who's the team that's willing to pay me the most and i might go to jacksonville or houston for the most money or something like that like um well i shouldn't say that about houston anymore now that they have cj stroud he might love to go play with this former ohio state guy but i I have a feeling he's going to be a little bit of a bargain you know there'll probably be incentives in it too because he's got to prove he can stay healthy so what five million that can become 10 million with incentives or something like that because he handpicks his team I think it's probably a play. I think he. I think he picks a spot, and they just kind of make it. They make it work. However, they got to make it. I think for him at this point, it's about just getting on the field, getting with the quarterback. He thinks he's going to have chemistry with, making plays, and then, you know, maybe a year from now, like things are a little bit different. But I think, I think for him, he just probably wants that palate cleansing season where he f- can just get into a situation where he knows, all right, this is my best chance to just completely be myself. And I think he felt like himself last season, and just felt like he didn't. He wasn't able to show it. Like I just yep. feel like he didn't think the the situation was right for him. So I think it's going to be about him, like you said, kind of tailor making a position for himself. So uh, yeah, I, so I think that kind of it's just going to be it's going to be unique. I, I bet a one year deal somewhere though, probably. Yep. Um, you know, like I agree with what you said about Jameis. I don't think that there's going to be like a a groundswell of like teams. Unfortunate, him to be a yeah. Starter. I mean, I don't un- think unfortunate for him and guys like him. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be Carson Wentz right now either. I don't want to be. Jimmy Garoppolo, I don't want to be Mason Rudolph. Like, yeah, it's it's hard to decide to pay one of those guys. Yeah, there's a lot of quarterbacks in the league right now. I I don't think I don't think the market's going to be too. Yeah, he the, he took a pay cut down to four million last year. I don't even know that he gets to four million this year. I um I think that's the max it would cost if he hits the market and he doesn't use like the the expiring contract dead money and all that stuff as leverage. I, I don't think he, I think he got the number from the Saints because of that. Like yeah. it was they kind of met in the middle of the two things and. I think his agent did a good job of getting him a good deal. Um, I don't think Zach Bond's going to have any market. I, I think you can probably get five. Him five what? Million? No. Like what did Shepard? Shepard and Saunders were around four or five million last year. I think I think that's their range. You think Bond's even less than that? Kate oh, Ellis yeah. was more like eight million. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean Kate Ellis have more production, yeah. better play. I, I don't. I don't. So you see think it. you get Bond for three million dollars? I would guess less. Oh, interesting. I think he's like league minimum. Okay. I, all right. Am I, I think it'll cost a little bit. I don't know. I don't know. He showed a little bit, but you're right. You're right. Probably won't cost a lot. If he did have to cost $5 million, then you're letting him go? Oh, I'm not paying that. Yeah. No, yeah. not a chance. Nope. Um, Ike Adam, I, I could see someone kind of coming after him, but I, I don't I don't suspect that he'll have a strong – I don't think anyone's coming after him to be a starter. I, I think he's kind of a secret. I I don't suspect him to have a, have a great market, even though I think he probably deserves – probably to be paid a little bit more than some of these other guys on the list. I just don't think he will be. I think he showed enough last year because he showed it so many times. Um, It wasn't just one or two good games. It was more like 10 or 12 that he feels like the kind of guy, like if you've got a young guy or if you've got an injury question mark and you know that you are signing a veteran who you expect to start about eight games or something like that, he seems like the perfect guy for that. Not to be your like full time. I've got him written in ink as my starter, but a little more than just a backup too. like someone who needs that. We're probably going to draft one and, and he could be penciled in as the starter in the meantime. I, I think that kind of thing could get you five million or more. Do you still bring him back if he costs that much? Depends what happens with Marshawn. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But um, if he comes back cheaper because he really liked his time here, uh, great for the Saints. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think everyone else on this list is is league, probably closer league to league minimum. Yeah, Lonnie, Lonnie Johnson, Johnson, Abram, Ugo Amadi, Malcolm Roach. I, I don't think – Maybe you pay two – like someone like Roach might get, you know, a two-year $5 million deal or yeah, something like that. and I think he deserves it. I think he's he's kind of slept on a little bit. I think yeah. he's a good player that, that we don't talk about enough. Nobody talks about him really kind of enough. But I think he's kind of important to bring back um, a little bit. All right. We're going to get into a whole lot more right after the break, so stick with us, and we'll be back in about 90 seconds or so. Are you tired of renting and ready to own your dream home? Contact Jefferson Financial Federal Credit Union, your trusted source for home loans. Our competitive rates and flexible terms can help make your home ownership dreams a reality. If you're a first-time home buyer or looking to refinance, our experienced lenders are here to help. Our online application process allows you to apply on your schedule. It's quick, easy, and convenient. Visit us online at jeffersonfinancial.org to learn more. Federally insured by NCUA, equal housing lender. Martin Wine and Spirits is home to a selection of hand-picked barrel select bourbon, whiskeys, and much, much more. They are family owned and operated since 1946 and specialize in wine, spirits, gourmet food, 
gift baskets, catering, and tasting events. They have many locations, so they're never too far away. You can check them out in Metairie, New Orleans, Mandeville, and Baton Rouge. Or if it's more convenient, you can always shop online. Whether you're a wine novice or a seasoned collector, you'll enjoy the Martin Wine and Spirit experience. All right, welcome back to the NFL Scouting Combine here at the Indianapolis Convention Center. Uh, I'm Nick Underhill. He's Mike Triplett. All right, our next segment is brought to you by Hard Hide Ponchatoula Strawberry Whiskey. There's been a lot of talk this offseason about the Saints needing a culture to change in the demands and expectations from players. We asked Dennis Allen Wednesday what his role is at, and he said the right thing about how it starts with him. So he's taking ownership of it and kind of what they need to do to get that back on track. How do we feel about what needs to be fixed? If the players aren't buying in enough or tune the coaches out, how do you decide when it's on the coaches and when it's on the players? And more importantly, how far off do you think the Saints are from getting back to where they want to be in that aspect? I think it's such an interesting, like, philosophical conversation. I mean, like, when Sean Payton and Drew Brees were here and, and they had those three straight seven and nine seasons, they just kicked everyone off the team, basically, except for, like, three or four guys, Teron Armstead, Cam Jordan, uh, whoever else stayed here, Brees, obviously. Um, they kick everyone else off the team, and then you get these quotes all the time about, we just have better guys now. We, we let that get away from us, and we got rid of everybody. But then when it happens to Dennis Allen last year and, and players are tuning him out, veteran players who everyone loves, um, you know, whether that's what happened with Marshawn Lattimore and Michael Thomas, Alvin Kamara's questioning the coaching. They're also talking about some of the young players weren't studying the tape enough. Everyone just blames Dennis Allen because they don't, they don't really respect Dennis Allen. So in, in Sean Payton's case, it was, well, the players need to listen to the coach. And in this case, it's like, well, the coach needs to earn the players' respect. So I mean, it obviously goes both ways, and nothing helps more than winning. If you win, people believe you know what you're doing. If you don't win, uh, people don't believe you know what you're doing. Uh, we've said on the show, and I think you know it, it's maybe a little insulting, but I think it's a fair comp. I, th- I think the substitute teacher comparison to Dennis Allen is something he really dealt with. I think a lot of players were like, th- you know, this is this guy's a caretaker. He's not the guy that set the culture. But at the same time, if you are Dennis Allen and Mickey Loomis, who called this players only meeting at the end of the season, you're like. Well, too bad. I am the head coach, and you have to listen to me, and you have to buy in, and you have to work harder, because you know that's what we demand. You know, so it's tough. Um, but I, I think I think hiring the offensive staff that they did, getting some of the offensive players excited about playing for this offense, and ultimately, if they start winning games, that's that's the way out of it. They gotta win. Yeah, they gotta win. You gotta win. Like, you, and look, when you're somebody that's won before and you have the accolades and you've hung some banners and you are strong enough to be the face of the franchise, the face of the city, like both of them, Sean and Drew were. Like, you go into the the DMV and like, there's a cutout of like Sean's head on the lady's desk <laughs> behind you, like, like you know, a cardboard cutout there would do your job on it, like. It's one of the first things I remember seeing when I moved here in 14. Like, and that's just kind of what it was. And when you're that guy, like the, the court of public perception, in, even in your locker room is that, you know, you carry weight. Like you're Sean Payton, man. Like that's – you earn that. You get to that point. So when you are that guy, like, it, yeah, it makes, it makes it a little bit easier to kind of send everybody out. And when you are somebody that's kind of went through – and they, they kind of did it with CJ a little bit. But, like, you know, Sean was someone that would – Send anyone out of here. Jimmy Graham, it didn't matter who it was, who you were. There were no, you know, nobody was above the law at that point. So it kind of resonates a little bit of a different way. But, you know, I don't know that DA's kind of earned that stature yet. So I think you kind of have to earn that stature. So when these things happen, whether we're right, wrong, whatever, even just on the outside, like it it, it just gets talked about differently because – You've earned it. Like, you've yeah. earned that benefit of doubt. And he, he just hasn't yet. He hasn't gotten to that point yet. And, you know, yeah, it felt tenuous last year. Like, it felt like a point. It, it's it's almost hard for me to, to, to discuss the culture because, like, from the player out, like, out aspect of it, um, you know, it felt like they were together. They did. Right. And it felt like there was a difference between the players and, and management, so to speak. And it kind of, there was definitely an issue there. But, like, when you went in the locker room, it didn't feel like there was an issue within the locker room. Like, the Sean teams felt like there were issues in the locker room. Like it was a really just, good point. It, it was a, it kind of hit a little bit different. So, you know, I think really to kind of cure all that, like it is, is, is you, you, you have to prove you nailed this OC hire. Your offensive staff is good. You have a good camp. 
you go to California, you have the kumbaya, all that stuff, and then you start winning games. And if all that happens, your culture is cured. Because I don't feel like there's a lot of cancers in the soccer room. Uh, you know, I think the ones that are bad enough, they're going to get they're going to find a way to get rid of. The ones that need to be cured, I think they're going to be able to cure them. It never felt like a collection of, you know, to use a crude term, like I said, like a collection of assholes. Like it just didn't feel like right. that in the locker room. It was just kind of like they were looking at their bosses funny and maybe not taking everything they were saying to heart. And if you win games, it, it changes, like all that changes. So I think really that's that's what it is. So how close are they to, to curing this? I think the answer is like how close are they to being a 10-win a team and feeling like it? Yeah, exactly. And look, the other part with DA is very specifically, look, he's got to get the offensive side right. He's not going to be successful if he doesn't. It was the same for Sean Payton all those years trying to get the defense right. But I think def- I think – Dennis Allen also needs to thrive at what he does best. He needs to to gain the respect of all these defensive players, which which he obviously has with some of them. But, I mean, we even heard the funny comments from Cam Jordan that weren't as strongly supportive as you want. He needs to go out there and, and be a top-five defensive coordinator, which he's been for much of his career, which they started out in January um, uh, of last year, which they you know definitely were, I think, for the second half of his first season as the head coach. If he reminds everyone that – he can create one of the best defenses in the league. I think that adds to the respect level. It's a, a good lot point too. about Cam. When Cam's saying things that are a little bit weird, like things are a little bit weird. Like yeah. he's, he's not somebody to to kind of you know he's kind of more pro team than I think a lot of people are. Like really loves it, all that stuff. Um, all right, moving on to our final topic of the day: the Martins questions of the day. We got two of them today. Martins is home to a wide selection of handpick barrel select like bourbon, whiskeys, and more. Martins so much more than just wine. First one. Since upgrading the pass rush is a need and has been discussed that the Saints could potentially add a couple of players there via draft and or free agency, what does that mean for the current players on the roster and who currently numbers out the five spots? If they add two, who are the guys that are out? This is a really good question because, I mean, it is easy for us to say they need two more defensive ends, a free agent and a first-round pick. But I'd, I'm not cutting Cam Jordan yet. You can't. He just restructured his contract. His money was guaranteed. So so it was an obvious – they didn't commit to him anymore if people think they did that. His money was guaranteed. Um, they're just accounting for it in a certain way. Um, Carl Graderson, they just re-upped. He's obviously part of this team. I mean, I think Tano Passigno is, is, has been a solid number three, number four type backup. I, I don't need to get rid of him. He, he'd be, maybe be an odd man out if they made two big investments. Peyton Turner, they would like to see him healthy and being part of it. Isaiah Foskey was a second-round draft pick last year. They'd like to see him come along. I, they're not carrying seven defensive ends next year, but I guess it would be a good problem to have. I mean, I guess if they if they double dip, then maybe Tano Passanio would be on the way out, or Peyton Turner might get. You know, you've got more options in case somebody de- is dealing with an injury like that, or maybe it is an argument to to add one true defensive end and have the other guy be more of the outside linebacker guy. You know, my um my thought process here, just kind of looking at, at the depth chart, like I, I really I really feel like the only guys that are guaranteed to be here or or Cam Foskey and Granderson, and I think anything yeah. could happen to the rest of them. Like yeah, of I know Peyton Turner was a first round pick, but if Peyton Turner comes into camp and he's, you know, they're someone's just beating them out. Like yeah. he he hasn't progressed to that point. Like, look, I think it, he has a lot of potential still, but you haven't seen it. Like he's definitely somebody that could get cut. Like it's it's and it's not too soon either. Like it would be a shame to keep him and have things not work out at the expense of like not getting somebody else sure, or of course. just being like, well we don't have room to get two, so we can only get one because <laughs> we got to keep turning. I don't think you look at it that you way. Can't, no, yeah. you can't. Um you know Kyle Phillips is the other one. I don't think he's he's an he's an unsigned free agent oh, right now okay. too. Yeah. All right. Um Nico Lalos is, is signed a reserve deal. Um he made a real strong run at making it last year before he ended up on the practice squad. But that none of those are deterrence to not no, say absolutely. we're already stocked no, yeah. the only guys that are guaranteed to be on the team are, are granderson cam and and foskey and it's because cam's contract i think keeps them here but um yeah i think anything can happen though you can replace any of them the top five or the top top three for sure though i mean i think those are the top three to me or, or granderson cam foskey then i go turner tano and you know i think that's probably probably how i would stack them Practically speaking, Turner be, being injured, like I probably be huge if you're him. right. If Fusky earns three, if Fusky through performance moves ahead of Tano and Peyton Turner, that's a great development for this offseason. Yeah, yeah, it will be. I mean, I think if you're just like stacking them in terms of like, yeah. you know, who's being kept or whatever. Yeah, I for sure. That's, that's how I would probably put them together. Practically, I mean, I think it's probably you know, Carl, Cam, Tano. Uh, Fosky Turner is probably how I'd do it. Like I have Turner written ahead of Fosky on mine, but 
you've got to be on the field for that to be true. Yeah, yeah so you can go either way on that one for sure. All right, uh, next one. Why didn't the Saints target any coaches from the Andy Reid coaching tree? They are all doing all the winning lately. So are the Shanahan guys. Like they yeah. th- they got. I think they got the right guy. I, I chose this question though. I liked it. First of all, they did. Um, Greg Lewis, who they interviewed for the head coaching job, was from the Reid tree. He spent a lot of years as Reid's receivers coach, and just this year uh, went to the Baltimore Ravens. It was his first year with the Ravens, but he came from the Andy Reid tree. So they they took a little bite at that too. They they explored a lot of different trees, which I think was was really smart of them. They even though most of them came from either Shanahan or McVeigh, they sampled a little bit here and there. I think it was a really thorough search. Um, and funny enough, Greg Lewis, who's the Ravens receivers coach, they ended up hiring his assistant receivers coach, Keith Williams. I, I have to feel like his name came up in those conversations too, um, which is another good reason to talk to people from all different systems all around the league. Hey, you know, we've never worked with this guy before, but maybe you hear his name over and over again. That could be how you find out about a Keith Williams. But the other thing that I think is really interesting about this question is, I mean, first of all, it is true. Like Andy Reid is, is just killing it. Um, but there's a little bit of a back for a while. All of his assistants were getting hired, but his offensive coordinator right now is Matt Nagy was a failed head coach for the Chicago bears. His defensive coordinator right now is Steve Spagnolo was a failed head coach for the Rams. And those two guys, it just feels like they're never getting another chance. Spags, I think, finally obviously had a really bad year in, in New Orleans, too, before all his success in Kansas City. But I think Spags is finally getting that second wave of how come he's not getting interviews? How come he's not getting interviews? Look how good he's done with four Super Bowl wins and the, the dragons he's slaying. I have a feeling he might get another chance. I don't know if Matt Nagy will ever get another chance. And and it's very similar to the, the Dennis Allen storyline of – if you fail once as a head coach, does does it ruin you forever? Dennis Allen only got a second chance because of how he was viewed by Saints ownership. And this conversation has come up a little bit with Clint Kubiak, too. He got that chance to be the Vikings offensive coordinator and call plays very young, maybe before he was ready. And he was working under his dad and, and Mike Zimmer, who he's close with, and he was like 32 years old. And it went okay. Um, and now he's getting another chance, and it's like – some people will say that as well. We love that he has experience. He probably learned from that. He'll be better the second time he around. He didn't really get fired, though. No, he didn't. That the whole staff got fired. But it is really interesting to me. Like it's it's been a Dennis Allen conversation. So like, like is someone like Matt Nagy not a good candidate to become a head coach because he failed once, or does that mean he'll learn from that experience? Like it is. It's always a very interesting question to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look. The thing is, though, like if we're just comparing systems of, of people, though. Uh, like, I think Andy Reid has a great system, great offense, all that stuff. But I don't know if I'm just picking blind and it's like there's two systems that are working really well. Kind of give me the one that's making all the bad quarterbacks look good. That's <laughs> a good point. You got the that's greatest quarterback of that's all time point. making this one go. Like, And that doesn't mean – that's just like a very rudimentary way to kind of look at it. But I don't know. The Shanahan system is working really well for quarterbacks that are kind of comparable. Like, if you line them all up, like – I don't think, like, Tua's leaps and bounds better than Carr, but, like, you get the production out of him. I don't think Purdy, you know, I think he's got a lot to prove still, like, as far as just his own personal journey or whatever. Um, You know, it took C.J. Stroud, like, who I think is incredible, but, like, I think the system helped elevate him too. Like, you always need that perfect marriage between player and uh, system, like, if you want to achieve true greatness. So, you know, I I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that, you know, the – I don't know. Like, it – I just I, I would rather have the Shanahan offense right now than the Reed one, and I don't know the league kind of sees it that way too. Like there isn't like a right. huge like Andy Reed influx like with the way there is. Right, with his the assistants one. were getting hired for a little while. What Doug Peterson, obviously uh, uh, Matt Nagy. Um, I feel like there's another one too, uh, and I'm drawing a blank. But um, but yeah, in his case, it was a little more Belichickian, where it was like, well, yeah. maybe just Reed is special and not the offense in the case of the Shanahan McVay offense there's like 16 examples of different versions of this offense have succeeded around the league yeah absolutely all right that's going to do it for us today if you want to sign up for the website make sure you do that use the code NOF 20% off your first payment I uh, appreciate you guys tuning in and we will be back on Monday from our studio in uh on Veterans Memorial Boulevard see you next time